I'm the transition dean for the new school focused on climate and sustainability, and I was asked you to give you a super quick overview. I know we're all eager to get to the main event here. Um, the two organizations, the Precourt Institute for Energy and the Nat Stanford Natural Gas Initiative that are really key in launching, launching the hydrogen initiative will both be key founding components of the new school focused on climate and sustainability. This is Stanford's first new school in over 70 years, and it's resulted from an inclusive long-range planning process. At every stage of the long-range planning process, students especially, also faculty, staff, and our external friends and stakeholders have called for Stanford to have an entity of scale focused on climate, energy, and sustainability. Um, we have therefore designed a school that's designed to have both the powers of institutes, which are the powers to foster interdisciplinary communities, like the one that's gathered here today for the hydrogen initiative, um, and work closely with external stakeholders, and the traditional powers of schools, which are to hire faculty, admit students, set curricula, and grant degrees. So we hope that this entity of scale will be able to have a major impact on the urgent issues of climate and sustain sustainability that are facing our world today. Let me turn to the Precourt Institute's vision statement, sustainable, affordable, secure energy for all people. I think everyone who's here today in the hall and online knows that of the 8 billion people in the world, a billion of us live without access to electricity. And another 3 billion cook their food using dirty carbon sources that contribute to 4 million early deaths per year. This is an urgent effort and Stanford has many efforts already underway to do research that's relevant to it in partnership with stakeholders. We need to not just double, but quadruple and octuple those, those efforts. Let me give you a few examples. Professor Frank Wollock's program on energy and sustainable development um, analyzes uh, economics and policy with a focus on developing economies. He has helped many countries design energy markets to meet their climate commitments. Professor Rishi Jain uses data analytics to assess energy efficiency and renewable energy opportunities um, to help retrofit existing urban housing and also new construction. And he has a special focus on the large rural to urban settlements where more than 800 pe million people live. Places that people can live that are sustainable are incredibly important. Um, and I just wanna, it's not only faculty, it's also students, a project that's actually led by a postdoctoral scholar uh, Michael McCullough is developing a solar power drying system that will help millions of farmers to dry produce like raisins, beans, figs, and chilies to boost income that's now at a subsistence level. Uh, doctors Jane and McCullough work very closely with local researchers and individual stakeholders to help put these inventions and technologies into practice as quickly as possible. So sustainability and affordability are key drivers of the energy transition, uh, but so is security. And security will be a significant topic, I think, in today's fireside chat. Let's see, where is Arun? Um, the speaker will be interviewed on the interplay between the energy and climate challenges the world faces and global geopolitics. So uh, we will shortly be joined on the Zoom screen. It will be my pleasure to introduce that speaker, Dr. Condoleezza Rice. Dr. Rice is the Denning Professor in Global Business and the Economy at Stanford's Graduate School of Business the Thomas and Barbara Stevenson Senior Fellow on Public Policy at the Hoover Institution, as well as that institution's director, and a professor of political science. From 2005 to 2009, Dr. Rice was the 66th US Secretary of State, the first African-American woman to hold the post. She also was President George W. Bush's National Security Advisor from 2001 to 2005, the first woman to ever hold that position. Prior to that, Dr. Rice was Stanford's provost from 1993 to 1999 and actually hired me as an assistant professor during that period. <laughs> Thank you for that, Dr. Rice. She's the first female, first African-American, and was the youngest provost in Stanford's history. It's also my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Arun Majumdar, who will interview Dr. Rice. Dr. Majumdar is the J. Precourt Provostial Chair Professor at Stanford, a faculty member of the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and former director of the Precourt Institute for Energy. From 2009 to 2012, Dr. Majumdar was the founding director of the US Department of Energy's Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy. Today, he chairs the advisory board to the US Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Grenholm. 
And in addition, bringing things back to the beginning of my introductory remarks, uh, Dr. Majumdar was the co-chair of the President's Committee on the Structure of the Sustainability Initiative that led to the decision for Stanford to form its first new school in 70 years focused on climate and sustainability. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Dreisen Majumdar. Let me just start by congratulating each way and the pre-court staff for putting this event. It's, we have been waiting for two years for this, and we're all here. And Condi, thank you so much for, for joining us. Let's just get right to it. Um, energy is always best discussed in the context of economy, security, and the environment. You started the Hoover meeting about two weeks back um, highlighting security. And you said we are living, and I'm going to you know, maybe butcher it a little bit, but we are living in disturbing and difficult times. Given the art of history of global conflict, explain to us the importance and the implications of the current conflict in Europe and what it means to the United States and to the rest of the world. Well, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, thanks to Cam. I'm, I'm glad I signed those assistant professor papers, Cam. It's been great for the university uh, ever since. And Arun, thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry I can't be with you. I'm a little under the weather, so I didn't want to uh, expose anyone. So, uh, But I'm, I'm glad to join you virtually. Well, I think that when we look at our uh, screens every day, um, our news screens every day, we see something that we really never expected, which is a breakdown of uh, the law-based uh, international order. We see a great power uh, literally uh, trying to absorb a smaller power, its neighbor, with uh, military forces that look like uh, they were charted in 1939. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine said, if you uh, put those pictures in black and white, you would be looking at 1939. And I think, Arun, this is a kind of shock to the system because we've had wars, obviously, but uh, nothing uh, that looks of this scale and certainly not with the avowed uh, the, the avowed purpose on the part of the Russians of eradicating uh, Ukraine. Uh, Vladimir Putin has told me, he's told many, that Ukraine is a made up country and uh, that Ukraine is really a part of Russia. So this is something that we haven't seen uh, since World War II and it's sending shockwaves through uh, the international system as countries try to find their footing in understanding how we could have gotten to this place. Thank, thank you, Gandhi. So, you know, a few weeks back, um, you know, when I was talking to you, actually, uh, you taught me about this balance between the economy, security, and environment. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking this way because you're in my screen out here. But, um, and one of the things that you explained to me was when you think about the balance, you, one has to also frame it in, in time scales. We have a now, we have a mid, mid to midterm issues, and we have long-term issues. So let's start about talking about now. Europe cannot turn off Russian um, oil and gas right away because the economies will be severely affected. People's homes will not have heating. And Russia is weaponizing energy to hold you hostage. What can and should the European Union and your broadly do now? What should the United States be doing on this issue? And what should the US be worried about in terms of, if any, Russia-China partnership? Or do you think that this is there's more to it than what the news media actually tells us? Well, let me start with the uh, balance that you talked about. Uh, it's almost uh, like an equation where uh, it all has to add up uh, to a positive sum for any society. Uh, when we talk about economic growth, we talk about energy mix and environmental sustainability. And now, uh, in large part, because of what has happened uh, to us over these last few uh, months, 
uh, security has been more on the agenda. But I would say, Arun, that uh, we should have been thinking about energy security quite a long time ago. Um, you mentioned the European Union. It's been a, a, a period of almost 40 years uh, since uh, going all the way back to the Reagan administration and every administration since uh, tried to convince the Germans that uh, pipelines that would make them dependent on Russian natural gas were ultimately going to be a bad idea. And instead, uh, the dependency of, uh, Eastern, of, of uh, Germany and to a certain extent Eastern Europe continued to grow and grow and grow. And so now we're living with the consequences of that as the shock has come quite suddenly. And we now have a near-term issue that really should have been a medium-term issue. If we had looked at this ahead, we would have said, do you really want to be dependent on Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Russia uh, for your uh, energy supply? And I think the answer to that, had we known uh, what we know now, would have been no. But we are where we are. And uh, so let me take the short term first. Uh, obviously, if the uh, Europeans particularly, and, and Germany is the core of this because Germany is the most dependent. If uh, Germany and Europe is going to lessen its dependence on uh, Russian uh, gas and indeed Russian oil, uh, it really gonna have to do three things. Uh, the first is in the short term, find diversified sources of supply. And uh, this is not easy uh, because uh, the Saudi Arabia is not stepping up to, uh, to have more production. Iran brings its own uh, problems, of course, because of the nuclear uh, weapons issues with Iran. Um, and the United States uh, is an expensive source, particularly of gas, because we are so far away and we haven't invested really in uh, LNG terminals and in uh, a pipeline structure. So finding diversified sources of oil is gonna be number one and, uh, and oil and gas, diversified sources of energy. That's the near term problem. Um, I think you will see uh, considerable pressure on uh, the Biden administration uh, to roll back some of the decisions that had been made that make it harder uh, for there to be actual oil and gas production. Uh, it's not so much that uh, if you had those leases, it would help today. But you know, too, Arun, that signals are important uh, to the uh, oil and gas industry. And the signals have been uh, that there was going to be, uh, that, that uh, hydrocarbons were going to be looked upon with disfavor. Uh, now, my view is in the short term, since we're going to be dependent on hydrocarbons, since we want to lessen the dependence on Russian uh, oil and natural gas, um, I would rather those sources come from the North American platform uh, than from less secure places. And so I think we need to rethink that. But when you get to the medium term, uh, we do want to begin the transition. We don't want to sacrifice the transition to a lower carbon, ultimately zero carbon uh, industry, um, a support for industry. And so we should be asking ourselves, what can we do in the medium term uh, that would actually help us to make that transition? And I think you know, Arun, that I am, uh, like many people, uh, the late George Schultz, Jim Baker, uh, and some other uh, prominent people from the other side of the aisle, uh, favor a price on carbon. Because uh, a price on carbon in the medium term would uh, help us with the problem that we've had, that when the price of oil is a certain level, you don't get the investment in uh, renewables, you don't get the investment in alternative sources of energy. So I would suggest in the medium term, uh, we're going to have to do something to uh, give greater uh, research and development funding, to give better signals to the oil and gas industry. And I think the best way to do that from a government point of view is the price on carbon. And then the final point is that then hopefully you've made a transition uh, to uh, an, an energy efficient but environmentally uh, sensitive uh, energy mix. 
And there, I, I hope we will have looked at all sources, including, by the way, nuclear, which I think gets undervalued in this whole picture. But nuclear is also a medium and long term. You can't really do much on the nuclear front in the short term. In the short term, it's got to be about where do you get your hydrocarbons. And I would say North America is best. So, Connie, let's okay. turn around this way. So, Connie, let's talk about the price on carbon. Um, as you know, things are not easy to get done in Washington. Um, what would you be advising both the Biden administration and members of Congress on getting things done, on, especially on the price on carbon, to send that signal that you want to decarbonize and actually, and many of the industries being part of the solution now? Uh, the problem is that this isn't a great time to talk about a price on carbon uh, right. because uh, of what Americans are seeing at the pump, uh, what you're seeing in terms of inflation, uh, the fact that we are essentially isolating a major producer of oil and gas in Russia at this particular point in time. So it's not the most propitious time to talk about a price on carbon. But as you know, uh, Arun, uh, some of the economists who talked about this, people like the late George Schultz, uh, people like uh, former Treasury Secretary uh, Hank Paulson, uh, these are people who believe in uh, a market-based economy. They don't believe in heavy regulation from the government. But the idea is that if you could put it in a larger context, perhaps talking about it as a medium-term solution. All right, we aren't going to do it today, but could we start putting things in place so that when we get through this immediate security crisis, we could talk about a greater balance uh, in how we are going to look to the energy future. Uh, I think that's probably the way to do it. Now, one danger in Washington is whenever you say something is medium to long term, it sometimes doesn't get done. You know that <laughs> because you've been in Washington. It's, a, it's all too easy to say, oh, yeah, we'll do that in the long term. But I, I do think that it, it isn't going to fly right now for a host of reasons. But if we could, again, begin the conversation, if we could, again, begin to structure what it would look like. Uh, people who are um, market free market uh, folks really would rather see it be uh, a revenue neutral uh, uh, carbon price so that if you collect it, uh, gains from it, it wouldn't sort of just flow back into the budget and again in increase spending. So there's a lot of planning and work and I think forums like this and uh, forums uh, that you and I are part of should be looking to the medium term to see how we could structure one when the time is right. This is to the audience. We'll open it up for questions in a, in a few minutes. But let me ask you a little bit about um, the COP agreements, the COP meetings, et cetera. You had you know, in publicly talked about uh, the COP21, the Paris Agreement, as one of the highlights of international diplomacy uh, amongst all the other bad news that we get. Um, we had COP26 where um, major nations made commitments uh, for net zero emissions economy in 2050, 2060, 2070. Um, we have now more than 60% of the Fortune 500 companies that have climate commitments. So, you know, this kind of alignment if, of major nations, major corporations, academia, I mean, this is unique in history. I don't think it's, it, it, this is unprecedented. So, should we be celebrating, uh, which I think a lot of people want to, but do you see clear pathways and outlines and should we be concerned about lack of real action? <laughs> and should we be raising the bar? What is, what is your opinion on that? Well, let me contrast uh, three international efforts. Uh, there was Kyoto, uh, which set unrealistic targets uh, and essentially no one lived up to them. I think the only countries to actually meet their targets uh, were some small countries and Germany, which fed it, by the way, because they were shutting down industry in East Germany. And so it made it easier to meet it. So I think setting unrealistic targets is not the way to go. What I liked about Paris was that it really did allow on a national basis countries to deal with the energy mix issues that we've just been talking about. Uh, so that it's economic growth, energy mix, and environmental sustainability. And we know that that's going to look different for every country. So, for instance, uh, the French get almost 80% of their generating power from nuclear. 
Germany has shut down its nuclear power. Um, when you look at uh, countries like uh, India, uh, for instance, uh, now huge developing country, uh, there are just certain things that you cannot expect the Indians to carry through on if it's if it starts to, uh, to constrain economic growth. So what I liked about Paris is that these plans were sort of built from the ground up, so to speak. And uh, countries made national commitments that I actually think would have been easier to, to keep. I'm worried about COP26 as perhaps being um, uh, too, uh, it, as to aspiration, fine, but is it too ambitious for, real, for reality, uh, for the, uh, the goals that were stated, for the obligations that were undertaken, can we really get to that kind of, um, those kinds of numbers uh, from where we are now? And uh, so I'm concerned uh, that we'll again uh, get frustration if we're, if we're not careful by setting unrealistic numbers. Um, I think it's very easy sometimes for countries uh, to sign on to things um, and then uh, not to carry them out. So I'm a little worried about COP26. Okay. Um, let me ask you, I mean, what you're saying is, you know, we have been on a carbon diet for about 150 years or so. Uh, or a carbon, carbon, yes. And now we have, everyone's telling us to go on a diet without the carbon. And um, as I can assure you, uh, diets often don't work. That's what you, <laughs> <laughs> is that a, is that a not different way to phrase it? That, and so we should not way. put targets. That's a, that's a fair way to say it. Uh, <laughs> we, we may have an aspiration for a certain diet. Uh, the question is, when uh, push comes to shovel, we carry it through. And uh, I'm concerned that uh, there hasn't been enough uh, enough attention given to what the transition has to look like how we're going to make the transition. Again, uh, you know, I was talking with some folks in Washington just recently, Arun, and they're very worried because with uh, the, the first subject that we had, with what's going on in Russia, it's almost as if people have lost sight now of these medium and long-term goal, goals because, oh my goodness, we, uh, we were about to take one of the major oil and gas producers out of the equation. Uh, we're going to have to substitute it what does that mean then for our goals? Uh, and so I like very much this idea of thinking of it in phases and uh, not getting uh, too uh, ambitious that we simply frustrate ourselves. Let me see, ask a little bit about the, you know, the carbon price. And this is obviously a price of carbon. It's very important to help the fossil fuel industry turn itself and in a profitable way become part of the solution. Um, we are also seeing other aspects, and I'd like to get your opinion on this, as our own Adam Brandt has found through uh, airborne measurements and, uh, and also there are satellite measurements now on the fugitive emissions. Uh, Adam found 9% of emissions, fugitive emissions coming out of the natural gas supply chain in the Permian Basin, in the New Mexico part of the Permian Basin, and as we know, anything more than three or four percent is, it, you know, natural gas is worse than coal. So, if you were to tell, get a gathering of CEOs and board members of oil and gas industry, what would you be asking of them? You know, how can they be part of the solution, and what are the solutions that they can create that others cannot? Well, I do think that uh, they are putting a good deal, at least the best of them, a lot into renewables. And uh, it, they're not just uh, hydrocarbon uh, uh, industries any longer. I think they do want to contribute on that side. So through R&D uh, to, uh, to help uh, fund and uh, put forward those. I think, Arun, what the oil and gas companies are looking for is, is certainty. I think that one of the problems that we've had is there's been a lot of whiplash. Uh, on, on the one hand, you're going to uh, drill everything you possibly can with permits as fast as you possibly can, and then the next day you're not going to do any. And of course, I'm overstating the case, but I think that's how it feels if you're sitting uh, in a boardroom for, uh, for oil and gas companies. And so that's one of the reasons that I think if you have mechanisms that can produce some certainty. That's why I like the idea of a carbon price because it can produce some certainty in a market-based way. 
way, I think we have to look for ways that they can have some, some certainty about where this is going. You might also say that some of the certainty could come from some of the phasing that we've been talking about. Uh, what are we talking about 20 years in which uh, we really are going to have to be very dependent on the uh, North American platform. Well, in the life of an oil and gas company, that's not very long uh, because many of these are 30 or 40 year investments. And so I would say we need to have a, a conversation, almost a track two with oil and ga gas companies to begin to look at their time horizon, uh, the time horizon that we want to meet or aspire to meet on the climate side and start to see how they how they adjust rather than just having uh, either yelling matches about it or even worse to my mind, everybody just sort of virtue signaling uh, without a plan to get anything done. Because I do think this issue of timelines of our, uh, who, whose timeline are we on and can we harmonize these timelines is really part of the part of the issue. Terrific. Thank you, Condi. And we'll open it up for questions. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any hands up. Um, there's one out here. So, Condi, the question is, okay, how do we, you know, in terms of timeline, we, there is energy security needs right now, but you want to harmonize it with climate goals in Germany, for example. And how does Germany do that? Is that what, what your question is? Yes, Mark. What is the time frame you look at? What is the time frame? Yeah. Like no. Is it two years? Is it three years? Is it 10 years or yeah. 15? Well, the Germans uh, really believe that they can do this in a relatively short uh, period of time. Um, I'm actually not so sure. Uh, it depends. There are conversations, for instance, going on with Algeria. Uh, Algeria has uh, significant gas fields that are lying fallow uh, at this point. Uh, Mozambique has gas fields, but there's been lack of investment. And so um, I think there's a sense that they're probably going to have to do this in a really short time frame, uh, 18 months, two years, as much as they possibly can. But the Germans also talk about conservation as part of it, uh, that uh, they will, will simply not be able to uh, use as much uh, energy as they have. And of course, they'd like to accelerate uh, renewables, but that's probably not on the time frame to help them with Russian natural uh, oil and natural gas. And by the way, I think the one thing to recognize is that the Russian uh, oil and gas industry uh, now pretty isolated. I mean, people are buying discounted oil on the market and never underestimate the degree to which you will get a black market in Russian oil. Uh, we did for Saddam Hussein's oil, it was a significant black market. So you will see some of that. But the core of the Russian oil and gas industry is going to be isolated for some time. One of the problems that the Russians have now is that since the majors, uh, the BPs and the Exxons of the world have left, uh, they don't have the technology to develop some of their very old uh, oil fields up around Sakhalin, which uh, need very sophisticated technology to, to uh, develop them. So I think you're going to see the Russian oil and gas uh, knocked out for quite some time. And that means that countries like Germany, um, kind of an interesting, just uh, contra to Poland, uh, you would, would have seen the stories over the weekend that the Russians have cut off oil, uh, cut off gas to Poland and Bulgaria. And interestingly, the Poles sort of just yawned about it because they had significant storage, um, about eight, uh, their storage facilities about 80% full. They'd already begun with the invasion in 2014 of Crimea to shift their sources. And so uh, there is a model out there for how this could be done uh, if you do it smartly. And I think you do want to do it as much as you can within, uh, with climate goals in mind as well. I was in Poland and the Baltics in 2015 on behalf of the State Department, and I can assure you they were all planning for this invasion at some point. Yes, they knew so it was coming. Was, they knew it was coming. And yet yes. I would say, I mean, one of the, I, the IEA, IEA report that just came out suggested that if people in Germany reduce the thermostat by one degree Celsius, they would reduce the gas consumption by 9%. Yes. yes. So this is it's very important from the energy efficiency point of view. Yes, and I think the Germans do want to look hard at the energy efficient part, efficiency uh, element. Uh, Sunita from the Department of Energy. 
Thank you. Um, my question relates to manufacturing. And as we know, with batteries and solar and you know all the offshore manufacturing, so and we're starting to see the same thing with hydrogen. So for electrolyzers, we have one uh, gigawatt factory announced, but we're seeing announcements in, in other countries where deployments is increasing. So um, Europe, China, you know, two gigawatt factory was announced in Australia. So I guess my question is, and obviously if we have deployment and demand locally, that will help incentivize the domestic manufacturing. Um, and, and off takers, making sure there are no stranded assets when it comes to hydrogen production and so forth. But my question is, if you have any perspectives on mechanisms such as the Defense Production Act and you know other mechanisms where we could you know provide that that um, guarantee. Germany has the the Global Hydrogen Foundation contracts for difference auctions, but specifically mechanisms like the Defense Production Act or others um, that you have thoughts on would be great. Connie, yeah, can you sure. hear that? Uh, oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, no, I was just going to say the Defense Production Act. Uh, we we put it in play a couple of times recently, as you know, around some of the COVID issues as well. And I think you have to be a little bit careful uh, that we don't start to get um, essentially a kind of industrial planning function uh, because the Defense Production Act is actually quite, uh, can be quite heavy handed. But certainly we should be looking uh, at mechanisms that make sure that we make the most efficient use in manufacturing as we possibly can of these of these new alternatives. Um, of course, the, the manufacturing is only a part of the issue and transportation is really uh, the largest uh, problem that we and others will have. But sure, I think look at all the mechanisms. I would just be careful. Defense Production Act can be quite heavy handed and I think people will start to wonder if we're, uh, if we're sliding toward industrial policy. There's another question, over there. and if you could announce your name and, and, and your affiliation, that would be great. Uh, yeah, this is Chris Redlick. Uh, I'm on the uh, Hoover board. Yeah, hi, Chris. Hello, Connie. How are you? Sorry we can't have lunch. Yeah. Um, the, uh, my question is a little bit longer term thing. As you eliminate hydrocarbons as a producer of energy, what does that do to the geopolitical stability given Russians' concentration and the Middle East concentration? And to some degree, Africa's concentration in uh, oil production. I would look forward, Chris, to the day uh, that I don't think you'll eliminate hydrocarbons, but to the day that you were less dependent on them, because I will just give you an experience from being secretary. Oil uh, went to $147 a barrel when I was secretary, and nothing warps uh, diplomacy like oil at $147 a barrel. Uh, it allowed Hugo Chavez to buy elections in Latin America. It allowed the Iranians to uh, to, fool, uh, to, uh, to proof their economy against sanctions uh, so that we had a much harder time on the nuclear front. <clears throat> and of course, the Middle East, which is always uh, up and down. And so uh, the, the smarter uh, countries of the Middle East, by the way, uh, are beginning to think about diversification because they can sort of read the handwriting on the wall. Uh, for all of its problems, and the regime in Saudi Arabia has many, many problems, uh, the, one of the things that that regime has tried to do is to uh, begin to diversify uh, the economy, similarly with the UAE. So uh, there are some Middle Eastern countries that are reading the handwriting on the wall. The Russians, frankly, didn't read the handwriting on the wall. That is still an oil and gas cartel. Uh, some 65% of uh, Russia's uh, exports are in oil, gas, and minerals. And so uh, they are, uh, they're gonna be trapped. But if I could get to the place that I could take the oil card, so to speak, out of the hands of uh, some of these uh, regimes that uh, are not afraid to use it for purposes that are very much against our national interest, I would uh, would do it in a second because the United States will address uh, will will adjust. Uh, <clears throat> yes, we will have to make internal adjustments uh, for uh, places uh, like the coal producing parts of the country, but the U.S. has an economy that will adjust. Uh, the smarter countries of the Middle East are trying to make that adjustment ahead of time, but there are going to be some who are going to be trapped in that um, in that world, and uh, I would be very happy not to have to deal with the oil card uh, ever again. Maybe I could just follow up on, on that question with uh, not the geopolitics of oil and gas, but the geopolitics of nuclear. 
Um, as we are now seeing, I mean, we have the former Secretary of Energy out here, Steve Chu, uh, when Fukushima happened and Germany completely got off nuclear and, uh, or decided to get off nuclear. And now we're seeing some rethinking, even in California, Governor Newsom is not rethinking, not shutting down Diablo Canyon. I, I don't know whether that'll happen or not. So if you are to be in the nuclear, I mean, clearly nuclear has to be part of the solution for decarbonization. Right. It's not just nuclear electricity, nuclear heat is very important. And if that's the case, what should the United States do, not only to be in the international game of nuclear, but also to, to get people in you know, countries like Germany and others to rethink on, along those lines? Well, the first thing we have to do, Arun, is to get our house in order domestically on nuclear. A house is not really in order uh, domestically on nuclear. Uh, you know, going back to the kind of uh, even folklore around uh, Three Mile Island, questions of storage and so forth, uh, uh, we, we haven't been particularly good at, uh, at stability in our own nuclear industry. And so I think uh, it is something that we ought to be looking at and then uh, helping others. By the way, I don't think it was Fukushima that, that pulled the Germans off. Uh, the Germans had been talking for a long time about getting uh, out of nuclear. Uh, we'd had many conversations with the Germans about this, and I think Fukushima was a little bit of an excuse, frankly. Uh, but now uh, everybody recognizes that you're going to have to have other uh, sources, and uh, nuclear could come if you if you make the investment and you get the infrastructure. Uh, nuclear is proven. Uh, you're not dealing with uh, with with um, uh, sources of energy that may not be proven and that we have to wait for this and that uh, to, to take place. And so I think it is a very big part, but I think it's going to start with the United States showing that we ourselves are prepared to use nuclear. And how would you change the sentiments on nuclear? Because there's a lot of you know, public sentiment, that's a major issue. Yeah, this is, and, and there's a lot of misinformation um, about nuclear um, as well. And so maybe part of it is, uh, is educational, uh, just getting people to understand better. Uh, you know, we, we get these things in our mind, uh, like Three Mile Island. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've heard it. The old joke is you get a, you know, sometimes when you get a piece of fruit that looks too bad, too big, well, that must have come from Three Mile Island. <laughs> so it's still sort of there in our national folklore. Uh, but uh, there's no reason that nuclear can't be safe. Uh, one of the problems is getting uh, somebody other than Nevada uh, to store it. Uh, every time we talk to any other state, it's kind of not in my neighborhood. So uh, that's, a, that's a hard problem, but I think it's one we've got to resolve. Questions from the audience? If you could just announce who you are and your affiliation. Yeah, Nico Balkamp with the California Fuel Partnership. This is a more of a general question and maybe a high level, the same level as that Ms. Rice is thinking on. Um, how or what, what would you recommend to industry partners that interact with the federal government as well as state government to provide certainty of signals? You mentioned signals earlier and, and get the right message across because I suspect that there is some confusion there as well. Thank you. Yes, I, I think the confu confusion has been there for a long time. And as I said, the worst thing about it is that it's it seems to be never in a steady state. And uh, as you know, uh, particularly when you're talking about um, investment, these are long tail investments. Um, I'm told by some people in uh, in the oil company world uh, that some of the really large scale investments uh, have not been made for seven or eight years because of uncertainty about the signals about what we intend to do about hydrocarbons. So um, I do think that the government needs to send stronger signals. I do think also, you know, we have another factor, which is not just the government, but it's the question of ESG in uh, companies, uh, in investment houses. Uh, is there going to be a, uh, a sense that, uh, uh, that hydrocarbons are disadvantaged uh, in investment houses and the like? And so uh, if, in fact, we're going to get this next uh, 15, 20 years right, uh, it's going to require some very, uh, very deep conversations uh, with not just the government, but also with oh, no. the private sector. 
sector about what it is we're trying to do. I think I've been thinking uh, in time frames, if we could lay out something that looks like a longer term plan, where we know what we're going to do in the short term and what's required there, where we know what we're going to do in the medium term and what's required there, and then can look to a longer term uh, where we try to start to meet some of the targets uh, of the the uh, of cop the, the cops and the like. I think everybody would have a better basis on which to invest. But right now, it's just whiplash uh, with every administration. Connie, if you don't mind, uh, let me take it international. Let's go back to the whole world. As you know, most of the population growth is going to be in emerging economies in Asia and mostly in Africa. They have a chance to leapfrog. Uh, into a energy system that is, um, you know, cleaner and perhaps, you know, and, and more modern. What would you be, if you were the Secretary of State now, um, what would you be going out and talking to them about in, in terms of how do you convince them that that's the right way to go? And what should they be looking for? I mean, they'll be, obviously, there's a lot of demand for finance. Um, how should we be thinking about that? Well, we certainly ought to be thinking about it as a part of our large foreign assistance uh, packages. Uh, there are some governments in places like Africa that actually have come to the United States and said, uh, you, we, we want to make uh, uh, an energy leap. Uh, we have something called the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which does these compacts with countries uh, where they get large amounts of money uh, for specific kinds of uh, uh, specific kinds of proposals that have been uh, worked together with labor unions and with farmers and the like. So one can imagine using some of our foreign assistance to really solicit from countries uh, ideas of how we can help them make the leap. Secondly, um, I think that you can never make it uh, any kind of energy uh, re reconstitution of energy supply uh, you can never make it an enemy of, of economic growth. Economic growth is always going to be first in the minds of these countries. And so it's why I've always thought there are three E's, economic growth, energy mix, and environmental sustainability. And if you can get countries to think of them together. One idea that I tried to put forward, but it never got anywhere, was to have uh, all um, energy, all uh, climate, uh, in anything that might help any... Uh, uh, technologies that might help on the climate side actually be tariff free. Um, I think if you could do something like that, it would send a very strong signal that uh, we, this is something that we care about in our foreign assistance uh, packages as well. And that is something, you know, I don't have much hope anymore for the World Trade Organization, which I think is, uh, is going to die a very slow death as everybody talks more about reliable and uh, trusted supply chains and so forth. I don't see any big World Trade Organization uh, uh, agreements coming out. But I can imagine something like uh, an agreement that uh, these technologies would be tariff free. And I think that would help uh, quite a lot. And it'd be an important signal. And is that a, some kind of a revisiting of the Marshall Plan again for clean energy transition? Yeah, something like that. Uh, but but again, you know, we've made a few other things tariff free uh, for health reasons. Uh, I think this would be something. Like I said, I I it didn't get to first base when I was secretary, but uh, maybe it would be time to try it again. Any other questions? If not, I've got one final question for you, Condi. Um, this goes back to what Cam mentioned at, at the end of her introduction about the new school. And we have a new school in over 70 years. You, were, you have been a provost out here. You've lived most of your academic life, uh, in fact, all your academic life here at Stanford. Um, tell us, give us your advice on how one should think about the new school. And when you talk to students and postdocs and undergraduate, graduate students, what do you see and what would your advice be to them? Well, the first and most important thing for any school, in fact, for any academic institution, uh, our academic uh, unit within the institution, is to be absolutely dedicated to um, research that is uh, transparent in its assumption, uh, that uses data and that let the data take you where they take you. So you, you've got to establish a reputation 
for not being uh, a school of advocacy, but for being a school uh, that is really looking for the best answers. I don't mean that students and faculty can't advocate, of course they can, but it has to be the first principle in the school that you're gonna look at a broad range of possibilities. People are going to be led to do the research that they wish to do. And uh, that we're gonna be prepared to ask, un, un, uh, to ask difficult and uneasy questions about uh, issues of sustainability. We've been going through some of them today. Uh, how do you think about uh, uh, energy security? How do you think about nuclear? How do you think about uh, the, the developing world? So uh, asking hard questions uh, has got to be built into the fabric of the school. Uh, the other point that I would make is focus on people. Uh, get the very best students and the very best faculty. Uh, give them resources and see what happens. Um, I don't believe that uh, top-down uh, planning of what a research agenda is going to look like will ever work in a university. And what is more, uh, we know that uh, you don't get the very best ideas that way. Those ideas have to come up uh, from the faculty, from the students. And uh, I don't, I'm not worried about it because I know Cam and, and I know uh, Steve and I know others and uh, they're not central planners. But to the degree that anybody ever suggests uh, central planning for the mission of the sustainability school, I would say run, run fast. <laughs> Well, on that high note, uh, thank you so much, Condi, for joining us. And let's give Condi Rice a big round of applause.